So Dr. Broderick in many ways needs no introduction. He is an internationally recognized expert on the treatment and underlying causes of stroke. Dr. Broderick's twofold passion is to improve the treatment and outcome of stroke patients worldwide using the greater Cincinnati and Northern Kentucky region as a model and to have world-class patient care and research for all areas of neurological disease at the University of Cincinnati Gardner Neuroscience Institute. His work and leadership led to the founding of NIH StrokeNet. This is an efficient collaboration across institutions for clinical trial selection and enrollment. Dr. Broderick's contributions to advancing stroke treatment, research, and education worldwide are reflected in multiple awards including the Daniel Drake Medal at the University of Cincinnati in 2010, and the National American Heart Association Clinical Research Prize in 2011. He's also been awarded the William B. Feinberg Award for Excellence in Clinical Stroke by the Stroke Council of the American Heart Association. The Feinberg Award is generally regarded as the highest honor in our field. So it's now my honor to welcome Dr. Joseph Broderick. Hi. My name is Joe Broderick, and it's my pleasure to talk to you about StrokeNet and the future of stroke research. These are my disclosures. The advantages of a national clinical trial networks are many. First of all, you combine many minds and ideas across a network to identify the most important clinical questions and design trials to address them. That's your pipeline. Probably more importantly, though, is you don't have to build a new infrastructure across the country or globally for every new trial because the infrastructure is always ready to go for the next trial. You can identify the consistently successful recruitment sites. You can have a centralized institution review board rather than hundreds of review boards. You can do consistent contracting. You can share best practices across the trials and network. You can have an experienced central research pharmacy that can help you design a trial, get study medication and distribute it. And then you partner with governmental research funding agencies that can provide monies to do the studies themselves. The vision of NIH StrokeNet is to be a leading platform for stroke trials in the US and globally. It began in 2013 and currently there are 27 regional centers, 24 that are currently funded and over 500 satellite hospitals, a national coordinating center, which is at University of Cincinnati, and a data coordinating center that's at the Medical University of South Carolina. StrokeNet focuses on phase two and phase three clinical trials, as well as ancillary studies and biomarker studies that are designed to advance acute stroke therapy, secondary stroke prevention, and stroke recovery. The population in the United States covered by the network is pretty substantial. This is from about five years ago. When we have a lot less sites. And even at that time, 60% of the U.S. population was within 65 miles of a stroke net center. This is the infrastructure. And I think the most important part about this slide is that it's really a partnership with the National Institute of Neurologic Diseases and Stroke as well as the coordinating centers, our regional centers. And again, we have working groups that focus on acute stroke prevention, and recovery, and rehabilitation. Also should be pointed out, there's a strong educational component to this network where we have stroke net fellows at each of our regional coordinating centers. This slide illustrates how many different trial concepts have come out of the pipeline and have been funded. So if we go back to the beginning, 122 re reviewed concepts have come out of the network since the beginning and as, as of July 2021. And they're pretty well distributed between the three groups, 46 acute, 46 re prevention, 30 recovery. And then these go to the NINDS executive committee who decides this is something we're interested, want to do, want to see it go forward. Now of these, 46 were approved, six were tabled for endovascular therapy platform, which I'll be talking about in just a little bit. Two were also tabled for more information, but of the 42 applications that have been submitted, 32 have been revised and 15 have been funded, which is 36% of those that are reviewed, which 
is a very high percent for those of you who submit grants to the NIH. You can see the number of stroke net trials and ancillary studies has increased dramatically in almost an exponential fashion since its beginning. This lists the completed trials and the ongoing trials. Now, the completed trials um, are the ones that are in black, are ones that the idea for the trial came even for our pipeline in the network. The red ones are all trials that came out of our pipeline. And the blue one came out of our pipeline, but is not yet done its award, even though it's been approved by NIDS for going forward. Stroke has already had an, an important impact on our clinical stroke care in the United States. The first trial that was completed was Diffuse 3. Diffuse 3 was stopped early, and it was a highly positive trial published in the New England Journal of Medicine. And its focus was looking at patients who were beyond six hours from onset out to 16 hours, and then looking at patients who had a large artery occlusion and then a mismatch in their brain uh, perfusion between a core area that was likely going to die <clears throat> and a larger area that was poorly perfused, but still could maybe be salvaged. And it turns out this did identify a group of patients in whom thrombectomy was very, very helpful. And this trial, not only did it change practice, it received the Distinguished Clinical Research Achievement Award given the top three of all clinical trials in the United States for 2018. The second trial was the Tele-Rehab trial. This was the first randomized trial of rehabilitation for stroke patients where they used telerehabilitation therapy compared to standard therapy. And it demonstrated that doing remote therapy via computer and camera and somebody working through that mechanism to help therapy compared to standard therapy, worked just as well. It was not inferior. And this, this trial demonstrated, particularly during COVID, where you may not be able to have somebody come in as frequently into the, to the ambulatory setting to get their therapy, how that could really enhance and extend treatment. And also, there's, uh, this is a great way of doing for people who can't travel for whatever reasons to the rehab facility three, four, or five times a week and so you could do this remotely once you had established this mechanism. And Dr. Duncan and Bernhard commented upon this in stroke in 2021, that this approach is something that's gonna be more and more important as we go forward into the next century. Now, stroke that's had an important impact upon stroke patients in our care, but the environment has also had a tremendous impact on stroke net. And here I'm referring to the COVID-19 pandemic, which has not only had an enormous impact on our clinical care of all types of patients across the world, but maybe even a bigger impact on clinical research. And this slide depicts how we were going along, both in the top graph, which is the acute trials, the middle graph, which is our prevention trials, and our bottom graph, which are our recovery trials. And you see these are the number of patients per month. And we were going and picking up steam when COVID just dropped us in our tracks. And initially we tried to have some changes in our, our network that still were still not adequate. So we made the decision to completely shut down the network, redesign all of our trials using things like electronic consent, remote consent, just drug distribution by mail. We did all our protocols, got all of those protocols reapproved by a central IRB. An example why having a central IRB is such a benefit. And then restarting the trial within 55 days of shutting down the network. And you can see we'll be able to get back up in recruiting, maybe not quite as fast as we were in the beginning phases before the pandemic, but still being able to be very successful and continue recruitment, even though we are still in the midst of a pandemic. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about the ongoing trials within the network. So CREST2 is a trial that started even before the, our network was begun. And it's a study looking at patients with asymptomatic chronic stenosis and then comparing 
aggressive medical therapy plus endarterectomy versus aggressive medical therapy alone. And then in a second companion study, the same thing, except instead of cryotectomy, we're using cryotectomy stenting. And it's getting pretty far along in terms of its recruitment. The crest H study looks at hemodynamic impairment in the ancillary study in, in CREST-2. So those studies are pretty far along. The first other trial that came out of our pipeline in terms of idea was Arcadia. And Arcadia takes the patients who've had a embolic stroke of unclear cause and then tries to focus down that population to patients who have an atrial cardiopathy. <clears throat> and that's the sign that, that's uh, identified by either enlarged left atrium and NT pro and B elevation beyond normal, beyond a cutoff, and the preterminal wave force on the EKG. If you meet any of those three criteria, you can be in the study, and then you're randomized to a pixaban, a novel oral anticoagulant versus aspirin. And again, you can't have atrial fibrillation. In fact, if you develop atrial fibrillation, you're out of the study in terms of the interventional part of the study. Arcadia CSI looks at cognition and silent infarcts in this same group of patients. Sleep Smart is based on the observation that sleep apnea is an important risk factor for stroke. And then patients after a stroke often have problems with sleep and can have sleep apnea. It's designed to take these patients who we can identify as having definite sleep apnea by testing and then randomizing them to CPAP, or the equivalent, versus standard therapy. And we're looking to see how it affects outcome, functional outcome in the first three months, but also re the recurrence of stroke. Most is the multi-arm optimization of thrombolysis in the ischemic stroke trial. And it's basically trying to build upon the use of thrombolytics, <coughs> whether it's TPA or TNK, and adding eptifibotide, which affects platelets, or a gatraban, which is an antithrombin molecule. And patients are randomized to the standard care or to one of these combination approaches. It's, we use what's called an adaptive design, which tends to eventually at one point put more patients in the arms that are doing the best. Transport 2 is one of our first recovery trials. And in this case, we're again looking at trying to help the arm recover after a stroke and we're using modified constraint therapy, but we have another additional treatment where we do direct electrical stim in through the skull at, at certain milliamperages at two doses. And then we also compare that to sham and we do this intensive therapy with this stimulation to see if this combination may be beneficial compared to just the standard therapy alone. And again, this is a phase two trial. So it's really a decision about whether we want to go through with the phase three. I acquire is another recovery trial. And this is a very interesting and cool study where we're looking at pediatric strokes. And you may not know that the highest risk for stroke is in the first year of life and in the oldest years of life. And then in between that, it drops down quite a bit until it starts to increase probably about the, past the age of 30 or so and starts to increase exponentially as you get older. But the point is, it's not infrequent. Most of the patients with cerebral palsy have probably had some sort of stroke event. So we take patients who've had a middle cerebral artery stroke and we do a very intensive therapy program that's age and developmentally specific for patients that are 18 months to three years. And they get this intensive treatment for either four, three to six hours a day versus standard treatment, whatever they're getting in their hospital or therapy situation. And they do that for a month. And then what we do is we have the one group that got the standard therapy, they can cross over at six months to the intensive therapy. So everybody will get an opportunity to be involved in that type of therapy uh, and we know that it, it has benefits in older kids, and we're now looking at, at younger children. The ASPIRE trial is a prevention study in patients with intracellular hemorrhage. The idea here is that patients who have atrial fibrillation, who have an ICH, the question is, 
Should you keep them on a blood thinner, in this case, a Pixaban, or should they be on aspirin? Because the Pixaban is more likely to prevent an ischemic stroke or other complications from their AFib, but probably would be more associated with bleeding in the brain. So this is a randomized trial to address that. Saturn and Saturn MRI is another prevention ICH study, but instead of hemorrhages that are predominantly um, in the deep area of the brain, we're looking here at, at hemorrhages in the surface of the brain and patients who already are on an, an, a statin agent. And some of you may be aware that statin agents in patients who have low bar ICHs and particularly ones that may be related, let's say, to amyloid angiopathy, are maybe not very helpful. They could actually increase the risk of hemorrhagic stroke in the future, at least in one trial they did, even though they're trying to prevent the cardiovascular outcomes. So this is a testing of whether to come off the statin or stay on the statin, and which is better in terms of the overall outcome of stroke and also cardiovascular outcomes. Active A and Active C are two COVID platform trials that StrokeNet is participating in, and we've been very successfully recruiting in. The fastest trial is another ICH trial, but this is one of our early intervention trials. In fact, in this trial, we're treating patients with recombinant factor 7A. 7A is a protein our body makes in the clotting cascade. It helps make a clot rather than remove a clot like TPA does. But the idea here, we're giving it within two hours of onset in order to improve outcome. And we're using mobile stroke units, exception from informed consent, to have, have ways to decrease that time from onset to treatment. Now, the other three trials, which are future and not yet enrolling, I'm going to talk about in a little bit more detail. So this is the Captiva trial. And the Captiva trial is looking at this group of patients who have a stroke related to a very high grade stenosis in the artery supplying that area of the brain, but if the stenosis is inside the skull, so the middle cerebral artery, internal carotid artery. And as you know, that this is a group that has a very high risk of recurrence, one of the higher risk of recurrence in all the different types of strokes. We also know that doing Stenting is not helpful in this group of patients because there's associated complications that are higher than the prevention rate of stroke. And this was seen in the Sampras trial. Right now, we use aspirin and clopidogrel for three months, and that's based upon the Sampras study. But we would like to do better than that, and we are trying to find that through the Captiva study. So funded by um, NIDS, but Janssen supplies the rivaroxaban and funding for placebo and AstraZeneca is providing ticagrelor. It's a 1,683 subjects with symptomatic infarcts due to 70 to 99% stenosis of the intracranial artery. You have to have non-disabling symptomatic infarcts less than 30 days. I'm gonna show you the amount of stenosis. And there's three arms. So one arm, is getting ticagrelor with the load and then 90 milligrams twice a day plus aspirin for a year. Another group is getting low dose rivaroxaban twice a day plus aspirin for a year. And the third is getting a standard treatment, clopidogrel and then aspirin, but not just for three months, for a year. We also test for the genotype that can affect how clopidogrel is metabolized in its activity. And we also do intensive risk factor management in general, as with Sampras and Crest 2. And then we follow up to 12 months. <clears throat> the reason why we're doing a three-arm study is because there's pretty compelling data for clopidogrel and aspirin, ticagrelor and aspirin, and low-dose rivaroxaban and aspirin, and at least for the first two in the first month or several months, and the others may be longer. It's efficient because we use one control arm and we're really evaluating two other therapies. The comparison is to clopidogrel arm, not to the other experimental arms. Ticagrelor, as you probably know, is a P2Y12 receptor antagonist. It has a maximal platelet reactivity inhibition at one hour versus clopidogrel, which is six to 12. 
It doesn't require activation of the enzyme, which means you don't have to worry about the genetics. And it may be more effective than clopidogrel, irrespective of the carrier status. And this has been seen in a, a number of different trials. This is ticagrelor and aspirin, a large artery atherosclerosis trial. And you can see that um, in both the extracranial artery greater than 30% and intracranial artery, there's benefit in the combination group um, compared to, I mean, to ticagrelor versus placebo and with pretty substantial hazard ratios in favor of treatment, particularly in the intracranial artery greater than or equal 30%. The low-dose rivaroxaban and aspirin are based upon the COMPASS trial and a, a couple other trials. And what you see here is that if you look at stroke impacts in these trials, there is a highly significant benefit for stroke, even though there's very few stroke patients that got into the trial per se. And, um, and the major hemorrhage was a little bit higher in that group, um, but not much difference in the intracerebral hemorrhage. And I do, oh, I'm sorry, just to point out here that particularly in subjects with previous stroke, there was a pretty substantial benefit. Why are we using 12 month dual antithrombotic therapy rather than three months? Well, in SAMPRESS, the rates of recurrent ischemic stroke more than doubled from three to 12 months. And half of US stroke neurologists surveyed already use clopidogrel and aspirin for longer than three months in patients with these high-grade intracranial stenosis. And if you look at the 12-month dual antithrombotic therapy, there were patients in Sampras that because of cardiac issues had to get both, both medications. In that case, you can see that there was a decrease um, numerically in the patients who got the clopidogrel beyond the three months, so from 10.8% to 6%, and a little bit increase in the major hemorrhage. This is a plan for five-year trial. We hope to be enrolling actually sometime in April. Things are moving along. And so we're very excited and probably be a trial. Hopefully you guys will be participating at your institution. The second future study is actually a biomarker study called Verify. And if you look at the history of recovery trials, it's, there's a lot of therapies that are being applied but the question is, are they being applied to the right population of patients? Similarly to the acute stroke trials, if you don't have a big artery occlusion, you shouldn't be doing endovascular thrombectomy because you're not gonna have any benefit. So here is trying to find out the group of patients who may be most responsive to certain types of therapy. So we wanted to find a way to reliably predict patient outcomes to improve who should be in various trials. And eventually this would enable us to give personalized rehabilitation therapy in the long term. So the primary objective is to validate the most promising biomarkers of motor recovery after ischemic stroke. And it's a first large scale perspective data set. We're gonna do 557 ischemic stroke patients and exploratory group with 100 patients with intracellular hemorrhage. The two biomarkers we're looking at are first a neurophysiology biomarker using transcranial magnetic stimulation. What you do is you generate electric field and stimulate the motor neurons. You then record over the muscle in the hand to see if you get a motor evoked potential. And then if you have a, a, a motor evoked potential, it means you've got a connection that's intact between the cortex the spinal cord and the nerve going out to the muscle. The second biomarker is neuroimaging. And here we're looking at MRI DWI to see what part of the cortical spinal pathways are damaged by the stroke. And the bottom line is a greater lesion load indicates greater structural damage and more and less likely that they're going to recover it. So the hypothesis one is that the relationship between upper motor impairment baseline in 90 days at the stroke depends upon this, this evoked potential, positive or negative. So if you're positive, you have an intact cortical spinal tract, and you're more likely to have a good outcome based upon even you know, what your 
baseline scale was. So again, this is going to be a very good predictor. The ones that have negative, even though um, they may have, some may have good outcomes are more less likely to have a good outcome. Hypothesis 1B is sort of saying, okay, we're going to look at the, the invoked potential, positive and negatives, but on top of that, we're going to look at this lesion load and that the outcome here is not just dependent upon the vote potential, positive or negative, but also the lesion load. So here you see that patients who have a smaller lesion load are more likely to have a reasonable outcome, even if they don't have an intact cortical spinal tract tracked by this other biomarker. And then hypothesis two is trying to see if we can accurately predict who is going to have a reasonable outcome. So this SAFE is the shoulder abduction finger extension score. The higher the score, the more functional you are. So if you have a greater than equal to five, then you look at your age, and then you see if you have a greater than equal to eight on day three or less than eight, or if you have a positive motor evoke potential or negative, this helps classify or predict people into excellent or good recoveries. So here, we're looking at people that had a positive um, evoke potential, and then they have a good outcome, even though their baseline function was not that great. And then if they had a baseline function not that great, and they were negative on the evoke potential, we look at the NI stroke scale score on day three. And again, the bigger deficit again, is likely going to be in this poor outcome. And the idea is if we can put people in the right category, we may be also to put the right people in the right trials. These are the eligibility criteria. Bottom line is you have to have had a stroke and then you have to have this safe score less than or equal to eight within this 48 to 96 hour period. And we basically get them consented and screened. We do the motor uh, stimulation and also the MRI. And if they basically are enrolled once they have gotten both the, the transmagnetic stimulation and the, the study specific MRI. And then we follow up out to day 90. This is another study that we think will be starting hopefully sometime in the later spring of 2022. The third trial I'll talk to you about is Rhapsody 2. It's a neuroprotective trial in the setting of patients undergoing reperfusion therapy within 24 hours of onset. It's got, it was approved and it's gonna be hopefully getting its award and then probably not enrolling patients until the beginning of 2023. What this, neuroprotective treatment is, is a mutant molecule of activated protein C. Now, again, those of you who are familiar with the clotting pathways and anticoagulation pathways in the body, activated protein C has a strong anticoagulant effect. It also has other effects, as I'll talk about, but this mutant gets rid of its, most of its anticoagulant effect by replacing several of the lysine residues by alanine residues, but it maintains its other effects, which are very beneficial. So for example, it can affects and vascular protects the endothelium, stabilizes the blood brain barrier. It can directly neuronally protect, it prevents neurogen promotes neurogenesis, it's anti-inflammatory. And so the idea here is to take all the good stuff with the stuff we're not trying to do with in terms of anticoagulation. And this was a phase two trial which demonstrated that it looked to be protective for hemorrhage in the brain after ischemic stroke. So here the primary aim is to develop, evaluate the safety and efficacy of this mutant APC for acute ischemic stroke in the setting of reperfusion therapy. We're looking at the outcome in three months. And key secondary is patients alive and without intracerebral hemorrhage at 30 days. You see it's a wide age range, ischemic stroke, and it includes patients who can get IV thrombolysis within four and a half hours, 
or standard mechanical therapy within six hours or standard care mechanical therapy six to 24 hours with, with favorable imaging and also for wake up strokes as well. So anybody who's getting reperfusion is essentially a candidate for this treatment where we add the active treatment versus placebo. So those are the trials that are gonna be coming in this next year, but what about other trials in the future? And now I'm gonna switch and talk about platform trials for endovascular patients. Now, if you've ever driven off a uh, high board or platform, you know it can be a little bit scary and exhilarating, but it's also something that can have spectacular results if you've watched the Olympics before. And we're hopeful that it is a way that we can get some great new results for patients with endovascular therapy. Now, why are we even talking about platform trials? Well, after the Diffuse 3 trial, there was so much excitement for endovascular therapy that everybody's mother and brother was submitting a protocol, a concept for endovascular therapy. There were so many of them that if the NINDS had funded them all, they'd run out of money, but also there would be no other part of stroke that we could do a trial in. And so they said, let's hold back. Let's see if there's a better, more efficient way to answer the questions that people are posing about endovascular therapy. So these trials included expansion to different population, different times. It also included adding something to it or an approach or a new device or the type of anesthesia and even how we use the pre-hospital systems to identify patients who may be candidates for endovascular therapy. So they put a hold on it. Let's say, why, why can't we do this better? Because the current approach has been, well, you start with a positive trial like Mr. Clean. Does endovascular therapy work? Well, it does in the alternative population. Can we expand it out to a later time window using imaging? So Don and Diffuse were positive. Well, then should we look at large cores? Should we look at small strokes? Should we look at distal clots? You can keep adding trials and trials until it goes on. But is there a way in which we could answer a number of these questions at the same time. The FDA's Dr. Woodcock in 2017 said our clinical trial system is broken and that she recommended use of master protocols that for multiple therapies in a single disease or single treatment in multiple diseases and develop a new clinical trial networks, which we're talking about with stroke now. So give me, I'll give you some examples of platform trials. So first of all, there's umbrella trials where you have multiple treatments and one disease. An example of that was the most trial that I talked about where you at least had two, two new treatments compared to the standard treatment for patients with very early ischemic stroke of a certain, certain severity. The basket trial is you got multiple diseases in one treatment. This would be like CAR T cell therapies for multiple different types of cancers. And then there's the minesweeper approach where you have one treatment one disease, but you're trying to figure out which subgroup of patients are more likely to benefit or adding another subgroup that wasn't included. And that's actually a lot of the trial concepts that we were being sent initially after the FUSE 3 was, was reported. And this is called a minesweeper approach. So the FDA has given some guidances about master protocols, adaptive designs, platform studies, and so we've seen platform trials expanding across the medical care spectrum. So we see a platform for prostate cancer, a platform for breast cancer, platform glioblastoma really just starting in 2019, platform from ALS starting in 2020, a platform for pain in 2020, and then finally the STEP platform, which is starting in 2022. Master trial protocols, what do they do? They eliminate cost and duplication of resources with traditional freestanding parallel group randomized trials. You can compare multiple interventions. You can examine effects across subgroups of patients with distinct but related clinical features. You minimize downtime between trials because you just keep adding new things into the network or platform. 
You can share control groups, which is a very important benefit. And then you drop arms, drop arms early when the treatments fail, and you can even combine promising treatment arms. So the NIDS put a notice of special interest out about a platform, and we responded, and this is now uh, beginning in 2022. And there's three components to this. So the first part is called Step Stone, where we're trying to look at different groups of patients who may benefit, whether it's large cores, smaller distribution of clots, um, smaller strokes. We're trying to do this as step stone. And then we'll be adding things in step smart, whether it's new devices, new additional treatments, new protective treatments like Rhapsody 2. And then finally, step lively, we'll be looking at systems of care and how that can improve upon endovascular therapy. We're using data that's already been collected either through the Get With The Guidelines stroke or the Neurovascular Quality Initiative Quality Outcomes Database. And then we're supplementing that for the various proposed studies. Here's an idea of the organization. Again, it's within StrokeNet, but it's also got a great deal of buy-in from the neuro and the vascular community who have been very important part of putting this concept together. And you see, it starts with the registry, actually, of anybody 18 years or older, up to 48 hours treated with endovascular therapy, and any visualized occlusion. And here are some of the subgroups that we're initially looking at and proposed. And then the rest of the concepts are things that are ongoing and in process. So finally, just to talk about challenges for clinical stroke trials. I've already mentioned COVID, which continues to be a challenge. One of the other challenges that is we, we sometimes have equipoise among our cardiology colleagues. For example, when we're talking about a trial in ICH patients where we're taking people off a of statin when they've already been on a statin. Well, there's some cardiologists who think everybody should be on a statin and they're not aware of some of the data suggesting that statin use in patients with low bar ICH may be not be beneficial. So we have to educate we have to work and talk to our cardiology, cardiology colleagues so we can come up with their approval for these studies and enrollment of their patients. So the severity of ICH patients is a real issue in prevention trials. A lot of these patients are really severely affected. And it's hard to get them involved in the trial and participating and making visits. So again, it's a challenge for us. One of the big issues, though, we've seen is recruitment in acute stroke trials outside of business hours on weekends. We're going to present some data at the ISC meeting coming up in February, where if you just are open Monday throughout Friday business hours, compared to being open seven days a week and seven days, 24 hours a week, your recruitment, not surprisingly, is about half of those sites that are open more often in these acute stroke trials. So we have to find a way of addressing this. And then finally, which I think you've all probably experienced here at your own institution, is the overload, the burden, and the loss of study coordinators and even clinical people that really impact our ability to do trials and clinical research in general. And that's a struggle that we're all going through right now. And I can speak personally to that even within our own stroke net. One of the things is being able to use tools to help recruit patients, explain trials to patients. And so if you're interested, these videos that we put together for explaining patients are really quite clever and interesting and fun. And if you go to our StrepNet website, you can actually look at some of these things that we put together to help recruit patients, help demonstrate to other people, investigators, how to enroll patients and again, it's one way we try to improve our recruitment and outcomes. And lastly, we've been talking about StrokeNet, which is the United States, but one of our goals in StrokeNet was the establishment of a global network of national stroke networks, a network of networks. And working with our colleagues in Canada, the United Kingdom, and Europe initially, we began the GAINS Network. And this has been a great forum for discussion of potential trial proposals, educational effort for our development of young investigators in planning for the future of collaborative stroke research. Currently, there's 23 national networks participating in GAINS. We have regular quarterly meetings. 
We have a meeting coming up to discuss new potential global trials here in the next couple of weeks. And again, several global trials have used this form to identify additional countries and sites for participation. So to summarize, clinical trial stroke networks are the present and future of clinical stroke trials. You don't have to restart a network every time a new trial is opposed. However, you need to be flexible and nimble in response to events like COVID. Hopefully you don't have a meteor strike here in the next couple of years. We can answer clinical stroke questions better and more quickly with global cooperation and isolation. And exciting new stroke trials are coming to a site near you. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Roderick, for that outstanding overview and your enthusiasm and hard work and everything you've done for StrokeNet. And thank you for joining us. We now have an opportunity to ask you some questions, and uh, I will just tell our audience to, to please send your questions through. We can, we can see them even now coming live if you uh, submit those. But, but I'll kick us off, Dr. Broderick. Uh, you mentioned in the beginning of your lecture this kind of uh, pipeline of how the studies uh, evolve, and, and it's, it started with concepts as the starting point of the pipeline. And that's a little different than how we may think of a funding proposal or, uh, or, or that more mature uh, proposal. So tell us a little bit about how concepts come to StrokeNet and how those concepts progress to a study. Sure. So there is a concept form for a proposed clinical trial, and we have the investigator team, which is a team, fill that out, and then they talk to um, the NINDS uh, person, in this case it's uh, Scott Janice, and make sure that there may be interest in such a proposal. And then what it does, we, we go to the acute stroke working group or the prevention working group or the working group for a recovery, and the, the people present their idea. And they, so they get a lot of feedback, a lot of give and take about, you know, what's, is it a good idea? Is there excitement about the idea? What things need to be addressed? How to make the, the project better? And then there's some give and take back and forth with that working group. Then what happens when that's done, that proposal goes to the NINDS and there's an executive committee group there that basically meets and what they do is they look at it and say, hey, this is something that looks like it be something that we could fund if it's reviewed well. And we also have a preliminary budget that goes along with that. We work with the investigative team to do that. And then if it's given approval, then we work really hard with the team on putting together the formal application. For those of you who know who's submitted a clinical trial before, it's a lot of work. I mean, it's not just the... 12 pages that you're putting in together to put the science plan together. It's a protocol, it's it's human subjects, it's feasibility, a whole lot of things that you have to do to get it together. So that's why it requires a team, an ability to get the proposal in, but still the person who's putting it in is the prime is the primary PI or primary PIs for the study. So that takes probably when you from the time it goes in as an idea to when we're submitting it formally, probably takes about nine months probably most, most times. Right. And, you know, one of the things about stroke is that stroke's a common disease, and you mentioned how many different uh, aspects of, of the disease there are to study. I mean, I think 15 stroke net trials right now. Uh, but within stroke, there's also some rare diseases. And uh, has StrokeNet thought about how to address some of these rarer diseases? I'm thinking of things like Catacil or Moimoy or Fabry's disease, things that do affect the cerebrovascular circulation but aren't going to um, you know, be as common. So remember, we're just dealing with trials, first of all. So we're not dealing with, I would say, science underneath understanding a disease or looking at the genetics of disease, those are those are handled through R01 mechanisms through the NIDS, and that's one thing. Now, when you talk about trials of rare diseases, that's a hard one because you, you need a lot of places in order to get the few cases that you have of a rare disease to see if it be tested. So one example of that is we've had a trial proposal of middle cerebral artery strokes in young kids, and I can tell you that's a relatively rare uh, event, but we are putting that through. We actually have a recovery trial with a stroke in young um, 
babies and young infants, you know, 18 months to three years. And that requires a lot of referrals to get those kind of patients in. So if there's a good idea and it's something that would bear fruit in a clinical trial, even though it's a rare disease, such as Catasol, you know, we, we could do that. But as I said, in a given institution, the number of Catasol patients you have is gonna be small. So you would need a lot of centers to get even the kind of a small group of patients to be able to test. Yeah, I think that some of the NINDS has sponsored even the, the concept of trial readiness way of kind of, kind of collecting patients across different non-stroke disease states, but, but something like that might be um, <coughs> fascinating. Another thing that came up in your talk was uh, a treatment using telerehab. This was one of the trials, and uh, that virtual platform as treatment. But how have virtual platforms uh, enriched trial enrollment, such as informed consent and follow-up? Has that been something that uh, StrokeNet has endorsed or uh, been able to give any advice on? So actually, we do a lot of e-consent, you know, remote consent. Um, and actually the consents are you know, done all on a smart tablet or a phone with the patient. And then that, that material is stored in a REDCap database. And we do that for not just the acute trials, but some of the other trials. Remember when I talked about when we got stopped by COVID, you just couldn't see anybody, right? Couldn't see anybody in person for any kind of trial. And so to be able to get consent for patients who often couldn't provide consent themselves, the only way you could do that with their families is by remotely consenting. And there's different processes you can, there's a process even for verbal consents with faxing, but the e-consent is the best way. And actually, if you do it right, it prevents some of the errors that can be made in a written document. I tell you from experience, there's lots of errors that accrue in written consent forms, but doing it digitally, if you make each step sort of like you have to do it right before you're the next step, to eliminate some of those problems. So we actually have done that quite a bit and changed all of our protocols and all the trials to, to uh, incorporate this. Great. Um, another question, you mentioned how industry has been involved um, in a different number of ways with stroke net trials. Uh, but of course, industry runs studies outside of StrokeNet. But if an industry scientist came to you today and just said, Dr. Broderick, I have an idea, I have a molecule, um, I want to, to, to go through um, a clinical trial, what advice might you give that, that, uh, that industry scientist? Well, first of all, I think you can go through StrokeNet, it's great. But if you're in a rush and you want to get it done in the next six months, that ain't going to happen because you have to have any trial that's funded by the government has to get reviewed. And, you know, there's no guarantee on a review, quite frankly. You know, you, you just put it in and, and you put in the best thing you can. And even if it's a wonderful grant, you may have to come back again, which means another year. So for small companies with great ideas, with not a whole lot of resources, you know, this is a this is an opportunity for in for companies that are willing to supply study medication or devices and they're not underwriting the trial in any great degree we can we can do that and we've done a lot of those as well we actually have one of the new trials of topography too is is has an industry sponsored it actually came through phase two trial funded by the um, nids again through the um, the neuronext network and now in the phase three it's through the stroke net so it's an example of a company, a smaller company that's taken a molecule and has gone the route with it. But just don't expect you're done in, in a year, but, which for the bigger companies, time is money. And so they often go you know, rocketing ahead with their own plans because they don't have to wait for a review. Yeah. Uh, we have a question here from Dr. Farhan Vahidi, maybe familiar to you as a colleague of ours. Oh, yeah. <laughs> uh, so Farhan sent a, a message. I'll, I'll read his question for you. It says, uh, thank you for the, spending your time with us today and for a great talk. His question is, if you were to go back in time when NIH StrokeNet started, would there be something different that you would do now that we have quite a few years of experience? Is anything that you would have changed about the, the structure of how, how it was built? I think one of the fundamental problems right now with particularly acute stroke research is that we just don't have enough people to do the work and particularly beyond business hours. But stroke 
is not limited to business hours Monday through Friday. So finding some way to support places to help have that infrastructure. I, one of our, it's, COVID has been hard, but I think some of the loss of staff, research staff at places has been a, every bit as hard, probably because of COVID, but it's hard over this last year or two in terms of keeping up recruitment. Um, we've, we've adapted things in that we're building in more incentive for those, not incentive, but support for those places that do things well. So some of our trials, if you recruit uh, two patients within a couple of months, you get an extra four or $5,000. And what that does is it helps support those places that are really doing work, but it's also, it's a help of a little bit of prod for people to kind of keep active and, and enroll. And so I think a more in, some of it more incentive, more reward to those sites that are doing well with, in, with enrollment, that would be something I would, um, I would change. The pipeline, I wouldn't. The pipelines work really, really well. Um, we've had a tremendous amount of uh, great ideas that have come that. That would not change. And I wouldn't change the, we didn't talk about it, but the fellow program that we've had that even predates Stroke Net, but was part of Spotrius Network, where we have at each of the regional courting center a Stroke Net fellow each year. But they have to have 50% protected time. Farhan's been involved with that. And we've had some places that have used the StrokeNet fellowship as a way of funding a clinic, a very clinical fellowship, but that's not the point of that funding. It's really to generate our next generations. And I can tell you that people that have come out of the Spotrius fellowship program and then the StrokeNet are now our next generation leaders. And so I think that's been also a great add to the field. Great. And I'll combine Dr. Vahidi's second question with, with one of mine, and that just thinking about this um, expanding the network internationally, but also expanding the network into the rural parts of the, the country where somewhat underserved uh, from our comprehensive stroke centers, from our academic centers, any, any thoughts on uh, efficient ways to do that? Well, so internationally, Part of the challenge, we, and we have global trials. We have two. We actually have two global trials and two other trials that involve Canadian sites. So we are doing that. But I can tell you that navigating all of the issues in the respective countries, contracts, the regulatory bodies, the the, the, the human subjects, it's all very different, and, and it's a minefield. You can spend a lot of time trying to negotiate things because industry doesn't have some of the limitations that if you're in NIH funded studies has and requirements. So that's part of the challenge when you go globally. The other thing about global trials is we're trying to find ways that different countries could pitch in and put money towards the trial. And we've had that with fastest with Japan. Uh, but the bottom line in many countries want the grant reviewed by their own body, kind of as an independent before they give the money. And so we're trying to find ways that we can have things go through different country review mechanisms so they can get monies and they can contribute to the trial. And that's been a harder process, quite frankly. Um, so that, that, that's a challenge. The rural issue is, is also uh, an important one. And we, in, 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 for instance, in Iowa, they very much is probably one of our most rural kind of sites. They have distribution uh, places where patients can be enrolled. I think that's going to have to be where we think about the virtual interactions because it's really hard when you're out in a small rural community at a hospital even if you're the neurologist there to do stroke research you know that's really hard you you may be able to refer somebody in but you're probably going to need to have somebody who can zoom in and talk to the patient and talk to them about a trial and maybe do some of the work from a central location rather than on site because i think that's the solution for a rural network just like the telerehab study which you could do remote therapy once you had them in for a day or two to train them you could have them go back to their to their place and they could actually do remote therapy in a way that is good for the patient as well as easier for the investigators so i think that that tele Tele interactions is probably going to be an important way for getting rural sites involved. Great. 
Well, I'll just thank you. I'll tell you the theme for our CME is Stroke 360, and when you see what you're doing with StrokeNet, it really is a 360-degree view of the patient and research. So thank you for joining us, and uh, have a great day. Thank you so much. Appreciate it.